Well, good morning to you all. Grace and peace from Grand Rapids, Michigan, to all of you who are participating in this conversation with a special warm welcome, dear friend, colleague, mentor, uh, Reverend Dr. N.T. Wright. Thanks, Tom, for joining us so very much. I'm delighted to be with you once more, one more time. Thank you. I'd love to begin our conversation today with um, uh, by thanking you for your work on Galatians and your January series address yesterday. Uh, toward the end of that time, you uh, had a chance to reflect really on the stirring call to unity in Christ uh, that, um, that emerges so powerfully out of Galatians. Uh, for all of you are one in Christ, uh, that, that a powerful message. And I thought it'd be helpful to, uh, to start a conversation about public worship, which is often so divisive. Um, by hearing uh, a bit about your ur sense of urgency around Christian unity, and then letting that in some ways be the, the context in which we uh, have our entire conversation today. Wow, yes, thank you. It's, um, it's been on my heart and my mind for a long time, um, really because studying St. Paul, which has been, as you know, the backbone of my scholarly career, uh, you can't miss it, although you shouldn't, well, maybe some people do, but you shouldn't miss it because every letter Paul writes is in some way or another about unity, about the coming together of unlike people. I mean, even the little letter to Philemon is about the slave and the boss coming together uh, as brothers in Christ. And uh, again and again, this theme of unity. And I think Paul knew perfectly well that left to itself, the church scattered around the Mediterranean world and individual churches composed of people who were socially and culturally very unlike, they would just fragment. And he knows perfectly well that if that happens, then what you get is a set of different sub-religion groups going on. And basically, Caesar takes no notice. Mm -hmm. Caesar is not bothered by funny people doing their own thing this way and that. But when a new vision of humanity starts to appear, not just as an idea, but as a reality, a new way of being human, um, and it's it's a, a praise way of being human. I mean, one of the passages that's meant a great deal to me recently is Romans 15, 7 to 13. And I constantly tell people, don't think Romans stops at the end of chapter 8 or even at the end of chapter 11. It's driving forwards. And the imperative that you may with one heart and voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Paul, as I think I said yesterday, leads on to quote from Isaiah 11, uh, the root of Jesse rises to rule the nations. But the whole of Isaiah 11 is contained, I think, within his mind there, which is about the wolf and the lamb lying down together so that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that sense of the total opposites, the hostile parties, the warring factions actually coming together in a new creation. Christian worship ought to be struggling constantly to be anticipating that new creation. And that I suspect will come out in some of our conversation right now. Absolutely, absolutely. As we go along here, uh, one of the things that has occurred to me is it might be interesting to take note of ideas that congregations, parishes, and other worshiping communities could put in motion as they describe their public worship services. I. I love to assign students to, um, especially seminary students, to imagine uh, writing a brand new web page that invites people to a public worship service. And what are you going to say? How are you going to introduce it? And I already think having a, a, a page that says this is a place where unlike people gather in unity in Christ comes right out of what you've said. So we've got a good start there, I think. Yeah, that's, that's great. But I mean, uh, for, for myself, I'm in my 70s now. I've been uh, a practicing Anglican Church of England most of my life. Uh, I have lived in other places as well, but that's the, 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 where I started and where I still am. And uh, the Church of England has now diversified enormously in its worship styles. Um, so that you get very high church stuff uh, copying Rome and you get extreme free church stuff with um, the, the, the worship leader movement having basically taken over and some services with uh, some meetings anyway, I don't know if you call them services, with no actual liturgy at all, just a string of rather disconnected stuff. And you, you hear my prejudices coming out. I actually think there is something to be said for order, partly because of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, but it's as though it's as though suddenly the garden has been growing all sorts of different plants and bushes and flowers and so on. 
And that's fine up to a point. And it probably tells us that things were a bit stultified before. But there comes a point with any garden where you have to say, well, that's fine. We've got lots of new growth. Now let's see if we can make this a bit more coherent. And even if we don't act, some of us don't like that bush over there or this flower over there, let's work together and make something coherent out of the muddle which is otherwise resulting. I think that's an imperative for the church in the next generation. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, one of the themes you noted in your first visit to Calvin is that um, a Trinitarian vision uh, might be one of the things that um, provides um, a norm or guide uh, for all of us. And, and I couldn't help but ask while we're still sort of warming up here, uh, coming out of Galatians, for a, a brief reflection on Galatians 4, 4 through 6, that powerful proto-Trinitarian text of the God sending the spirit of his son into our hearts. And, and what that um, might mean for informing how we think about prayer, uh, uh, singing, and other liturgical acts. It is an extraordinary uh, little passage because I think Galatians was written um, within 20 years of the crucifixion. I think it's written in the late 40s. And we have this dense statement. And part of the point is it's, it's a, a retelling of the Exodus story. We were slaves, but God yeah. made us sons. Already Jewish ears are twitching that this is the story we know. It's how we were brought out of slavery in Egypt. And God said, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And having done that, having redeemed Israel as God's son, God then came to dwell in their midst. And there are some Old Testament passages which talk about the dwelling of God in the tabernacle in terms of God's spirit. Um, there's a passage in Isaiah, there's a passage, um, uh, there's a passage in Nehemiah, and there are one or two others as well, which speak of the spirit in that way. And Paul seems to be drawing on that to say, uh, yes, the one-off act of redemption, God made you sons, and now God comes to live, not in a tent, but in our hearts. And the sign of that is that we call God Father. So there's a kind of a tying up of it. And I've often said to people, for many of us, for half our lives, the doctrine of the Trinity was just something we gave lip service to. But this, this is actually about life, about new creation, coming and transforming us. And, and that cry, Abba, Father, uh, the, the characteristic Christian cry, our Father which art in heaven, whether Paul had the Lord's Prayer in mind, I don't know, but um, certainly this is how Christians have always prayed, so that the prayer of the church as a whole is symbolic of and actually uh, uh, emerges from not just a Trinitarian vision which we have in our heads, but right. a Trinitarian reality which has caught us up in, in within God's life. Right. Well, that website uh, uh, might need to have language about that, about how you know we don't go to church in order to get things started, but rather to be caught up in something that uh, that is that God has begun by this yeah. act of sending the Spirit. Yes, it's it's something that has been occurring to me, and I, I think to my wife as well. Maggie and I came back to Oxford two years ago, two and a bit years ago. A lot of that time has been in the pandemic, so the churches haven't been open, the college chapels haven't been open. But one of the things here in Oxford, which we always enjoyed and now are enjoying again, is the great uh, Anglican service of choral evensong. And there are many of the colleges, and there's one right opposite the other side of the street from where I'm, I'm sitting here, New College, which has a world-class choir. And during the term time, they sing evensong four or five nights a week. Um, and Merton College, where I'm a member, uh, do the same thing. And these are wonderful services. And people are sometimes puzzled because a lot of it is sung by the choir. The congregation does not join in with the Psalms or with the Magnificat or whatever. Um, at least they don't join in audibly because the choir are doing it magnificently. And people sometimes think, oh, well, I want to take part. And, but actually, the answer is this is part of the great river of prayer that has never stopped flowing right from the beginning. And this prayer is a daily thing. It's a, it's a regular, it emerges into actual sound for an hour or so every uh, weekday evening. And then Sundays, of course, particularly. But actually, it's a river which is going on, as it were, underground. And we can just step into it and be carried along. And sometimes we get to join in with the hymn and certainly saying the creed. And we say amen to the prayers. But there's something, uh, this is a sort of let go and let God approach to liturgy. It's, I don't need to do this. I don't need to be energizing this. Thank God for the church, which in the power of the spirit has yeah. been energizing it. And I can just share in that and be taken somewhere that I mightn't have got under my own steam. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Um, 
uh, before we go to a, a list of terms <clears throat> that we'll talk about, um, I'd love to hit one more touch point in Galatians. I, we could spend the entire time talking about Galatians. There's so much here. Um, and that is the, um, this amazing fruit of the spirit text. And uh, in some of your writing, and again, as I was rereading Galatians, I was so struck by the inclusion of the term gentleness in that list. And then um, Paul comes back to that term uh, in chapter six again. And it occurs to me that um, that is not a term we hear a lot about advanced as a, as a particularly Christian virtue. Um, yes. uh, is, would you mind saying just a brief reflection about the inclusion of that uh, kind of term in the list? Yes, obviously, this is a, a somewhat of a stylized list. Paul has these seven fruits yeah. of the spirit, um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, and, and I suspect he's used that list often. But there is a particularity, and I mentioned this yesterday, about this in Galatians, where it looks from the middle of Galatians 5 as though part of the problem is that the stirring up of the agitators, getting people all bothered about this and that, and particularly the, the imperative to circumcision, which is being wished on some of them, is actually making them, as he says, bite and devour one another. This is breaking out into physical violence, as though nobody had actually taught these early Christians in Galatia that violence between Jesus followers is actually not a good idea. Um, yeah. And of course, we in the modern West have nowhere to hide on this. Certainly, you know, think of Northern Ireland, think of many other places in the last three or four centuries where Christians have fought wars against Christians and so on. But it was it was local and sharp edged there. And so I think Paul has quite deliberately produced this list, which is about actually the sign that the spirit is at work in your midst is yeah. kindness and gentleness and graciousness and self-control holding back angry impulses or any other wrong impulses. Um, and uh, people have often sort of said sneery things about oh, old fashioned Christian ethics and so on, um, uh, as though, well, they usually mean sexual morality when they say that. But uh, actually, when you look at what Christian ethics is all about, it's very hard to argue with kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and all that. Um, and we do need to remind ourselves of those things. Um, and, and actually, anyone who's ever stumbled into a church as an outsider, as, as a visitor, you know, you're on vacation or something and you happen to go into a local church, uh, they'll tell you if, that pe if the people there were kind to them or not. It yes. makes a deep impression. A kind welcome goes an enormous way, makes people feel, oh, this is good this is this is a good place to be whereas if somebody says oh where do you come from you both go and sit over there a sort of oh dear maybe i've come to the wrong place um, yeah. and that's that's a simplistic analysis but i think paul is putting his finger right on something that the galatians needed to hear and and obviously we do as well because we've got so many different factions within modern Western Christianity, and they tend to be polarized so easily along political lines in my country as well as yours. And uh, we need to go back to that list and pray for a fresh outpouring of God's spirit to be the people we're meant to be. Well, and it occurs to me that um, uh, on our church websites to be able to say, um, we're not there, it's not perfect, but what we're trying to embody when we gather in assembly uh, looks a lot like this list. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a pretty uh, countercultural move in many places. And uh, yes. it's. Yes, that might well be. That might well be. I mean, of course, there are places where Christians are beleaguered and a minority and, and, and ha find themselves being very defensive and, and so on. Um, but the, the danger when that is the case, the Christians, for instance, who are much a minority in the country where they're living, um, the danger in that case is that the fearfulness and the anxiety can make people turn in on themselves. And there are factional fightings within that minority church. And I've seen that in one or two parts of the world. And it's a very, very sad sight. And, and we have to remind ourselves always of that.